Welcome to the SCATS AI Living Lab Lecture Series. My name is Jan Frenzel and I'm going to introduce you to the area of performance uh, characterization, performance measurement and performance analysis. Today, data influences our lives more than anything else. Whether you insert search terms into a search engine, update your status on a social network, or when you buy something via the World Wide Web, um, which is then delivered to your home. In all these cases, data uh, needs to be processed by the service providers. Uh, in the last years, the amount of data that needs uh, to be processed and also the amount of data that is uh, generated in general um, has increased tremendously. In fact, in many cases, uh, the data has reached a size where a single computer is not enough to process the data anymore within reasonable time. In order to cope with the high amount of data, many computers are combined to uh, build a larger compute cluster. Data is distributed uh, over the computers of such a cluster so that each computer works on a smaller subset uh, of the total data. Thus, data can be processed that would not uh, fit onto a single computer. However, due to the distributed way of data processing, the complexity of the application rises because it is now important to distribute the data evenly over all available processes and also to keep the workload for each processor the same. Sometimes, one process also needs to access data that requires intermediate results that are stored elsewhere, requiring synchronization and leading to communication between processes. Several frameworks such as Apache Hadoop, Apache Spark and Apache Flink help users to create applications for hiding the complexity behind functional building blocks. Various blocks exist offering functionality ranging from data integration and data cleaning to graph and machine learning. With these blocks, a user only specifies which functions to apply on the different data partitions and in which order. The framework then distributes these user-defined functions to the data splits, applies them and distributes intermediate results where they are required. Synchronization and communication don't have to be specified by the user as, as they are already uh, contained in the function blocks themselves. To get this working, it is required to have some processes running on the uh, computers of the cluster that help managing and distributing uh, the tasks to the processes. Each of these processes has to be configured. Thus, one has to create a configuration, including all the settings for the computers. Some of the settings are fairly basic, such as specifying network addresses so that processes can find their counterparts and are able to send data to them. Other settings establish some level of security in the cluster and other settings directly relate to the performance, such as the number of compute cores uh, for the processes or the memory space um, for data storage in relation to the memory space uh, for data uh, sending and receiving. Once the cluster is configured and the required processes are started, a user can run her application, which automatically distributes the user-defined functions over all computers in the cluster. What is good at the first sight is also challenging at the second. Unnecessary delays in the data processing on a single processor or when data is sent over the network can now cause the whole cluster to waste time waiting for intermediate results of the slow processor. Waiting time can also be caused by an unbalanced distribution of data to process. When processors require the intermediate results from an overburdened processor, but how would a user notice this if the framework hides all that information? 
And is this delay caused by the user's application, the framework itself, or some configuration setting? At least for the first question, the answer is simple. One has to measure the execution times and collect further information. Several possibilities exist depending on what needs to be measured. For testing different configurations, benchmark suites such as HiBench exist that contain applications that stress different parts of the compute cluster, such as network, storage, a single processor's compute power, or combinations thereof. Such applications can be run on datasets of various sizes. The benchmark suite measures the duration between the start and the end of, of the application. So, if one runs the benchmark with different input data sizes, one can estimate how the big data cluster scales. Further measurements, after some of the settings are changed, could validate whether the change improves performance or not. However, parameter optimization is relatively hard because of the sheer number of parameters. For example, Spark has almost 150 to 180 parameters, depending on a publication you read. Not all of these parameters directly relate to the performance, but sometimes particular applications are sensitive to specific settings, whereas other applications are not affected by these settings. Part of our research is thus to find out which parameters are important for which applications. If one focuses on the optimization of the application instead of the configuration of the cluster, the total runtime might not be a good indicator for the performance of the application. One needs to split the application into phases and find out which of the phases is worth optimizing. Luckily, Spark and Flink have monitoring capabilities included, which could give a first insight. This monitoring has the benefit of presenting information about the performance of the application from a perspective that the user already has on the application. The user gets an overview over the duration of function blocks of her application. A second display shows the time used on each processor. However, the drawbacks of this approach are obvious. First, uh, this way of presenting the information only covers the surface, as the user could not see what the framework does in the background. Second, it is not easy to compare two runs of the same application, as there is no display to compare information side by side. Furthermore, since the displays are provided by the framework itself, and thus framework specific, one could not compare a Spark application with a similar Flink application. In this situation, we had to look for tools that could help us to analyze applications. In the area of scientific high-performance computing, with its parallel applications based on message passing and accelerators, such as graphic cards, there are a few tools for performance analysis. An important one is the performance data visualization tool Vampir. It is built to help a performance analyst with various views such as used to investigate parallel execution, used that show the sequential execution of threads, dynamically regenerated summaries, and further views. Uh, it allows zooming to focus on areas with interesting or unexpected application behavior and also supports comparison of application runs, which is exactly one thing we identified as a disadvantage of Spark's or Flink's monitoring capabilities. So we created a transformer that takes the performance data from Spark or Flink and stores the data in a format that Vampire understands. Thus, we can reuse the comparison features of Vampire to compare different runs of a single application. Apart from that, the data is also stored in a format that is independent from Spark or Flink so that we could also compare Spark and Flink applications. That approach, however, does not allow to record more details about an application than is recorded by Spark or Flink itself. When we looked further, another framework was interesting, 
SCORE-P allows to insert measurement code into an application and collect performance data. This way, we could even go further and collect more information about the process. However, SCORE-P could not be used out of the box as it was created for other application types. In the past, applications for high performance clusters were written mostly in C, C++ and Fortran and use other methods to distribute the workload in the cluster, such as the message passing interface, multiprocessing and offloading to accelerators via CUDA or OpenACC. Thus, we extended SCORE-P so that we could easily add measurement code to applications based on Java technology. The measurement code is essentially code to emit different kinds of events, such as for the beginning and end of execution of a method or thread. When the measurement code runs, each of the emitted events also contains a timestamp, so that we have the exact time when a method was executed. Because we could select the method we are interested in and add measurement code specifically to this uh, method, we keep the overhead low while also being able to incorporate framework internal procedures in addition to the events that we get if we just track the user-defined functions. This allows us to look behind the scenes to see what the framework does in the background when the workload is distributed. Furthermore, we could decide whether we use the events to sum up durations to create a so-called profile or to simply store the events to create a so-called trace. Again, we use Vampir to display the recorded traces. This time, we could not only see relatively coarse-grained execution times of the user-defined functions, but also how these functions interact with the functionality provided by Spark or Flink. We also extended SCORE-P uh, so that it adds measurement code to the file-related procedures, so that Vampir could also display when files are opened, closed, read from, or wrote to. Further extensions include numerical metrics such as memory consumption or garbage collection times. There are also student works focusing on the tracking of communication of Spark and unification of traces of different processes, so that traces of different processes uh, form a single consistent trace. To give you an idea of what I've talked about so far, I recorded the execution of an application on a Spark cluster, which I ran on Taurus, which is a high-performance computer. So let's start with the converted information from Spark itself. I start Vampir with the file containing the data. Let me quickly import a group definition file to make it easier to distinguish the uh, stages and tasks. Now, the stages are in violet, whereas the tasks are in a slight, slight uh, blue. A stage represents the execution of a function block on the cluster. A stage typically consists of tasks uh, which represent the parts of the execution which are uh, distributed among the cluster resources. So in this case, this stage 0 consists of 5 tasks, uh, which is um, also uh, not surprising because we were using 5 input files. The question is, does it change someone? So are there stages which contain more tasks? So to see that, I adjust the process bar height and quickly find out that here it seems like there is a stage which contains uh, more tasks. In this case, this is the last stage which contains 48 tasks, which is also not surprising because 48 um, was the maximum number of processor cores which uh, I used in this example. Okay, up to now we didn't have to add code to the application because we were just using the information that Spark, Spark uh, provides us. So now let's look what happens if we um, take the recorded information into account. So in this case, um, measurement code was added to a process um, and this process uh, runs parts of, of the task that you just saw. Um, 
So in this case, it took a bit longer because the file uh, was a little bit bigger, even though I selected a subset of functions for recording and not all the threads contain events, as you can see. Again, let me uh, quickly change the appearance by selecting a grouping file again. So in this case, um, the interesting part of the application is more or less here, because you can see that um, here we have a lot of events and a lot of things um, happening. So in the, this bluish color we now have the tasks again, but with this um, reddish color we have the functions which are uh, related to Hadoop. And we can also see the I.O. operations which are here marked by these yellow arrows or yellow triangles. So if you want to uh, look at what a particular thread is doing, you can simply select the thread and uh, drag it down to see what the uh, thread does. And if we zoom uh, in, we can find also a part where we see that we have a task which runs, which then uh, calls um, the function read, which then results in an HDFS read, which is the Hadoop distributed file system. And here we can also see that it reads a part of the input sample of our application. In this case, it reads just one byte, which is not very efficient. So to look at this from another perspective, we can also use the shared resource timeline. Um, here we have the same information again. We see all the um, different um, I.O. resources and can see where the events happen so on which uh, I.O. resources. So if we zoom out again, uh, we see also the uh, events are spread among these I.O. resources. Okay, so let me quickly close these views because I also want to show you the uh, counter data timeline. Um, here we can select also a different metrics. These are now um, like numbered numbers. Um, so if we are interested in a process CPU load, then we can also select this metric um, to make this a little bit more appealing. Take the average. So here you can see that this executor actually doesn't use much of the CPU resources. So only a fraction of 0 0.1 of the uh, CPU resources are actually required to run this application. Now, as you have seen, um, a lot of these information are not very uh, semantically meaningful um, because we just have this task run. So the idea would now be to incorporate the information that we uh, got from the previous uh, view. So in this case, we take the comparison view and take the information about stages and tasks which we just had and also um, uh, take the, the other one with the more detailed information. However, now we have the problem that um, since these are two different uh, recordings for Vampire, we have to adjust the, the offset from the first one. So now um, we can use these two um, traces together. So, and this kind of concludes the overview over Vampire. To summarize, applications using Spark and Flink are complex. Performance analysis of such applications is challenging and can have various approaches depending on the target of the investigation. Established tools such as Scorpi and Vampire can help the investigation by simplifying the measurement and providing displaying and analysis features.